Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So, indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing. Delicious. When it's July and the heat puffs up from the river, Broadway's a place of regret. The winter dreams made for the summer are blurred. The golden girls fan themselves with newspapers. It's the time of the salt tablet, the fly paper, and the sullen sleep on the fire escape. The mornings are filled with the thousand hours and the bleary talk and dead cigarettes in the bottom of paper cups. It's summer, the poet's time, the lover's time. And if you can afford an ocean voyage, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Which is equally true for a policeman if he's retired, if he's come into a fat inheritance from Uncle Ned, ex-wonder boy of the oil fields. Not me, nor Detective Mugovan. We were still working to pay off the bills. Current job, stakeout in front of an apartment house in the West 80s. Stakeout for an armed robber who had shot a bystander to death, ran across roofs, down alleys, finally trapped. He's holed up on the second floor, Danny. Empty apartment. Ready? Let's go. All the other tenants cleared out? Uh-huh. Had a little trouble with the people in 2B. How come? People named Morgan. Their grandmother died. A funeral. We got all the mourners out. The apartment right next to the one our killer's in, 2A. You sure he's in there? Probably him, Danny. Description fits. Let's find out. Open up. Open up. This is the police. Yeah. Hey, those windows over there, Danny, open. The screen's been kicked out. Come on. The killer left this apartment in a hurry. Uh huh. These windows lead to a fire escape. You could have gone out this window onto the fire escape into the next apartment, Danny. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah. Must have done it this way. The screens on this apartment have been knocked out, too. Let's go see them. Huh? Yeah. This is the Morgan apartment, Danny, where the Morgan grandmother... Want me to look around? For appearances, Mugman. I'm guessing our man walked out with the mourners and got lost. Must have made him happy. Greetings, Danny. Well, looks like we made a boo-boo. It amuses you, Sergeant? Well, Danny, it is only that I am trying to tickle your funny bone with what otherwise could blossom into a severe headache. You got out the all points on the killer? Goes without saying. The bulletin is out, but the puzzle lingers on. Oh, that Mugovan and I were on him and he got away from us? No puzzle, Gino. We lost it, that's all. Ah, be friendly with yourself, Danny. Such things happen. The puzzle to me is that a burglar in his chosen line of duty should so overstep himself as to enter the ranks of the killers. <laughs> Overambitious type, huh? He tried to beat his way into Mrs. Conlon's apartment on West 76 with a gun. It bothered a neighbor. The neighbor tried to stop him, tried to beat him off. 
The neighbor got killed. You got any other troubles, Gino? Well, nobody's got troubles compared to the way Mrs. Conlon's got troubles. A man with a gun tried to get to her. He didn't make it. If I were Mrs. Conlon, it... What'd you say? About Mrs. Conlon? Well, when your call came in, Danny, the name Conlon registered on my gray matter. So I nudged it up a notch by referring to a file and flash. It came to me that like a year ago, a Mr. Hugh Conlon was found shot dead at the side of an unidentified woman, also shot dead. Verdict? Murder with suicide. This Conlon was the husband of the said... Hey, yo, yo! To see Danny Clover, permission must be obtained and granted. Don't try to stop me. Don't anyone. Who are you? Now, don't try to bypass me, sir. You have spoiled the plans of Lucian Cobb, funeral director. After we'd rehearsed and rehearsed. This is a new type show business, Danny? Sit down, Mr. Cobb. Tell me what I've done to you. I'll not sit, sir. While bearding a criminal, you this morning did destroy the careful staging of a month. We rehearsed the old woman, Grandmother Morgan. How the little old lady would lie in her coffin, her pose, her attitude. And when death took her, we were ready for it. And now... You're saying our trying to take a killer ruined your carefully planned funeral. How? Twenty minutes ago, the granddaughter of the deceased phoned me, told me tearfully she'd opened a clothes hamper, and there was her grandmother folded in with last week's wash. I'm sorry, Mr. Cobb. Death has a dignity, Mr. Clover. You... I'm aware of it, Mr. Cobb. Do you know? Yeah, Danny. That's how the killer got away. Climbed into the coffin himself. Get on the phone. Find out what happened to that funeral. Tartaglia did very well. He lifted a receiver and dialed and asked a question. He got an answer and replaced the receiver. Hey, Danny. The hearse took off for parts unknown. Deserted the rest of the funeral. Make some more calls to traffic and to highway patrol. And wait. And finally a call comes back. One hearse located on a side road off Queens Highway. Driver recovering from pistol whipping, but still bewildered by the strangeness of it all. Go there and talk to him. Look, mister, the first thing I want you to understand is I'm not lying to you. Just tell me what happened. We were cruising along through the streets, uptown toward the cemetery. It happened at 180th Street. What did? There's a glass panel between my driver's seat and the, you know, the coffin, the flowers. That's where the tapping came from. Tapping? Yeah, with the butt end of a gun. The coffin was open, and this guy was kneeling there with the gun. Then he busted through the glass, pointed the gun at my ear. Says, take a right here. I took a right. Wouldn't you? Go ahead. I took a right. I took off from the rest of the funeral. A long nose, a head full of red hair, and a big gun. When we got to where we are now, he tells me to stop this hearse. To get out. I get out. He slugs me. Is that all? Is that all? You think this happens every day? And phone it in and check out for the night. And go home. Find the heat piled high in your room waiting for you. And take the blanket and the pillow to the roof. Step carefully past the sleepless child, his eyes wide with reflection of nighttime. And hear the whispered, tired scolding of the man at his side. And the rustle of the woman's cotton robe as she pulls it tight to her throat. And find an empty place and consider there the pattern a killer has scarred across the summer's day. Consider it. Then make your way back downstairs to the hall phone. Ask Mrs. Conlon to meet you at your office in the morning. And go back for the sleep you left on a brownstone's roof. In the morning, she was already waiting for me. And with her, a young woman who took a cigarette from a plastic case and waited for me to light it for her. Thank you. You're sweet. Uh, My daughter, Mr. Clover. Uh, Myra. Hi, and hello. Uh, Myra insisted on coming with me. She said she didn't want me to be alone with you. Don't lie, Catherine. Myra. The reason I came, Mr. Clover, it was a chance to meet a new man. I told Catherine that. The poor thing's trying to cover up. (laughs) She doesn't mean that, Mr. Clover. Myra's a child. All the excitement, that man trying to break in, your call last night, a a child's mind. It it can be too much for... You through, Catherine? Because if you aren't, Mr. Clover will never have the chance to tell us why we're here. The man who tried to break in, Mrs. Conlon, had you ever seen him before? Uh, Why, no, I never... uh, I told you that yesterday. Why do you ask again? Maybe the attractive man doesn't believe you, Catherine. Myra, what are you trying to do to me? 
You come in here and make a show of yourself before this man, talk fresh. Mrs. Conan, had you ever seen the man before? No, I told you no. Yesterday was the first time he beat at my door. When I wouldn't let him in, he threatened me with a gun. And then that nice neighbor from across the hall. He's helped Myra and me so many times, and now Mrs. He's... Conan, try to understand why I'm going to remind you of... Of what? Remind me of what? Of your husband's death, of What's how... he got to do with it? What's my husband dying a year ago with that nameless woman got to do with it? Patience, Catherine. Let the man tell you. It's only that the killer we're after might have had something to do with this other thing that happened to you. It's the only way I can figure it. Why should he beat on your door openly with a gun? Well, Why he's should... a thief. He wanted to rob me. A thief who stands in a hall and knocks and asks permission to... What are you trying to do to me? Hasn't there been enough? Haven't I had enough? Oh, Myra, tell him... Danny Clover speaking. There's a man sleeping in my boarding house. Answers the killer's description you got in the papers. You want him? I give him to you. Where? Boarding house. 1756 West 61. You come from right away, huh? So I can put my room to let sign. Back in the window. Quick turn over. You can go home, Mrs. Conlon. I'll ask the killer my questions. <laughs> I'm telling you, mister, when I give this man a room, I thought there was something funny. Why didn't you call the police then? Just because she was breathing hard, like he'd been running? Well, that ain't no reason. The reason was this morning. Oh, when you saw his description in the paper. Yeah, yeah, the bright red hair, you know, and the nose. He registered last night, and he hasn't gone out since. Is that right? He had a caller late last night, late. Who? Well, I don't know who. I don't peep. He made a phone call from the hall phone, went back to his room, and later I heard someone go into his room. How long did the caller stay? I went to sleep. I don't know. Where's his room? Uh, 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 down on the right. I'll take you. Here it is. This one. Give me the key and step back. Hey, he's that dangerous? You got to use a gun? Don't worry about it. Ooh. All right, you. Wake up. On your feet. On... Deep sleep already. He really sleeps, huh? <gasps> What's the matter with him? What's the matter? He should have peeped at his collar. He would have seen what a murderer looks like. <laughs> For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The July twilight bleeds the color out of Broadway's neon, and the street is a summer's sigh done in pastel. The delicate cottons cling to the visitor's shoulders, and their husbands shoo them away from Broadway's kindly folk. And Broadway's forced to other summer delights. The boat ride to Coney. Try that, kid. The quick shipboard romance. And at the end of it, the guided tour through the Hall of Mirrors. Or the rendezvous at the coffee pump in the automat. Or just stand on the corner and sniff the cool air from the Catskill sent in the open envelope from the wife and kids. And compare its message with the one in the headlines. Fugitive killer found murdered in boarding house. And decide, it's better here, kid. Happiness is where the heart is. It's better here. And at headquarters, feel the twilight slip from your fingers as the door opens. And the night time is brought to you in the capable hands of capable Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. I come to sound the hour, Danny. At the sound of the bong, it will be late. And even now, the aroma of the cacciatore that awaits at Tartaglia's house is being wafted from uptown down Center Street to tickle the nostrils. Bong. 
Give me what you got, Gino, and then you can go home. Thank you, Danny. You are indeed a kindly, generous employer. Did the ballistics check the gun that killed Joe Gruber? No, it is the same with which this Joe Gruber murdered an innocent neighbor in the to-do in front of Mrs. Conlon's apartment, which proves to all concerned that this Joe Gruber was indeed the murderer of the innocent neighbor. Uh, anything else? What is else is that Detective Mugovan has compiled for you the criminal record of the aforesaid Joe Gruber, which I will bring. It seems that in his this past, Joe Gruber Danny, was... I got the record on Gruber. Detective Mugovan, I'm surprised at you. What's the matter with you, Gino? Well, I was about to parlay the information you have gathered. Efficiently, I grant, but I was about to parlay this info into the ear of Lieutenant Clover with my own mouth. When you were so rude... Oh, you did good anyway, Gino. You can go home now. Mrs. Tartaglia will be waiting for you. She'll... She at least appreciates the endeavor I make to... <clears throat> good night, Lieutenant Clover. Detective Mugovan. Good night to all. Good night, Gino. Tell Mrs. Tartaglia you were fine today. Tell her I... What's eating him? Call him up in a little while. Tell him you're sorry. Well, what for? What'd I do to him? Oh, just do it, Mugovan. Okay. What have you got on Gruber? Oh, Technical's got the knife that killed him. Trying to trace the make, manufacture, distributor, retail outlets, etc. You, uh, you said you had a record on him. Yeah, 20 years long. Gave it to us when an officer booked him up for disturbing the Pell Mell Rotisserie and Bar on 3rd. Got in a beef with some woman, Malder. She yelled police. Happened five days ago. Oh, who was the woman? No, we don't know. She didn't show up to make complaints, so we released Gruber. You want the rest to run down on him? If it means anything. Well, that's up to you. Uh, Gruber began 20 years ago in San Francisco. Car heists, filling station holdups. They finally got him good on a negligent manslaughter charge. Fifteen years in San Quentin. Released six weeks ago. Next heard of it, the Pell Mell Bar. Then released to murder Mrs. Conlon's neighbor. Then dead on arrival. That all of it? Yeah. Anything, Danny? Not much, huh? It wasn't much, but it was all I had. Joe Gruber had been mixed up in a disturbance at the Pell Mell Rotisserie and Bar, which was on 3rd Avenue, which took up 40 front feet of sidewalk, and whoever was thirsty enough to dare what was inside. The inside was all bar and three fellas deep, the rotisserie part of it being a cheap hot plate burner that melted things upon occasion. It took a few minutes to get close, but I finally made it. And yeah, what's yours? Talk. I'm from the police. Here, Batch. Oh, something wrong? No, no, just talk. Oh, sure. Hey, Ed! Come here, take over, will you? I gotta talk to a guy. Yeah, scooch down to the end of the bar, mister, so we won't get our talk mixed up with people. Uh, better, huh? Hey, uh, can I give you something from the shelf? Some Johnny Walker? About a week ago, there was a little trouble in here. At least I keep the trouble inside, off the sidewalk. Uh, take a look at this picture. You ever see this man before? Well, who is he? Name's Joe Gruber. His eyes are closed because you took her while he was on the slab, huh? That's right. Yeah, I seen him. Like you said about a week ago, trouble with a dame. What dame? I don't know. I didn't see much what happened. I got told. Had you ever seen Joe before? Uh, first time. He was in here, picked up one of my customers. You know, throw the arm around the shoulder, I'll buy you a drink pickup. Friendly, buy drinks. I ask him to pay. He says, sure, sure, my sister will be in a minute and pay. He looks serious, so I fed him drinks. Later, I was back in the storeroom, I hear yelling. I get back in time to see a cop off the beat, hauls this guy away. Leaves Mal standing there. Drinks unpaid. Mal? Mal who? The armor on the shoulder pickup. Mal! Hey, Mal! Mal, come here! Yeah? Well, what do you want? Yeah, my friend here's a cop. A very nice yeah, cop. Out of my way. Hey, come back here. Let me through. Let me through. Let go of me. Let go. If I'm going to have to take you down on the floor to talk to you... Hey, that's where you're going. How'd you get here so fast? It ain't been five minutes I opened up that pay phone. But it was only because the operator got slippery. A man's got a right. Let's go. Look, I'm booked, ain't I? So give me my shower and a cell like always. What, am I different or something? I want you to look at a picture, Mal. Here. You know that man? Must have been a lot of long-distance calls from that pay booth you tumbled, Mal. That change could add up to grand larceny. It was that much, huh? I guess I'm just born lucky. It's going to be a hot summer in that jail yard, Mal. Sit down, Mal. Cigarette? 
Your friend's got a cigar in his pocket. Muggerman? Yeah. You want a light? Here. My feet are killing me. Put them up on my desk. <sighs> Comfortable? Well, what's your trouble, fellas? What about the picture? The guy's name is Joe. Bought me drinks. Nice fella. Very nice. My cigar went out. <sighs> now let's let's hear all about it. He buys me a lot of drinks, tells me the story of his life. Now how he did a lot of time on the coast, you know. Mm. A lot about his sister Mildred. He liked his sister Mildred a lot. Go on. You know, he says his sister Mildred ran away to New York, got herself married. Uh, this is about 20 years ago when she was a youngster. And by the time sis Mildred got back to Frisco with her hubby, Joe was in stir. His sister Mildred come to visit once, then he lost track. Ain't seen her since. Well, how'd he fi- happen to find her in New York? Phone book. Looked up her married name on the off chance, and there it was. He called. Did he tell you what her married name was? Might have. Uh, slipped the old mind if he did. He called her, said he'd wear a red posy so she'd recognize him. What a dame shows. <laughs> Guess what happened? Danny. Leave him alone. She walks over to Joe and asks, is he Joe who called? Joe says, I am he, only you ain't my sister Mildred. My sister Mildred had red hair like me, he says, so they walk over in the corner, they start to talk. Then the lady raises a roof about something, starts to hurry up. Joe runs after her right into the arms of the law. What did this lady look like? Frankly, Joe fed me too many drinks to remember queer. Huh? That's about it, boys. Uh, light my cigar again, huh? <laughs> Muggerman picked the nickel thief up by the frayed collar and carried him off to the showers, which left me alone to sift the pleasant time we'd had together and come up with a name, Mildred, Mildred Gruber, the sister who had run off to New York 20 years ago to marry, and wonder why it wasn't Mildred who showed up when Brother Joe phoned her, and wonder why it wasn't possible to go and ask her herself. But for that, you needed her married name, the name only Joe Gruber could tell you, the dead Joe Gruber. And remember that the city has a hall of records and that girls' names are entered there for births and deaths and marriages. Go to the hall of records. Be handed over to a man named Franey. Wait for Mr. Franey to come back from the long voyage into the files. Finally, he does, waving his find under your nose. I found it, Lieutenant. Found it. Thanks. Let me... Uh, I'm afraid you couldn't read my scroll. I'll translate for you. On May 12, 1931, one Mildred Gruber applied for a marriage license. Age 19, height... Who'd she fi- apply with? Uh, got that, too. Uh, Mr. Hughes Conlon. Age 27, height... Conlon, fi- eh? Uh, Look up what you have on Conlon. Please, Mr. Franey, do that. Wait again. And know somehow Mr. Franey would look just like that when he came back. Well, you got something this time, Lieutenant. Conan was married again, just three years after the first time. And I looked and looked, and there's no record of a divorce. The penalty for false statements is clearly stated on the bottom. Sure it is. Thank you again, Mr. Franey. Hi and hello, Mr. Clover. Come on in. In here, the living room. Say, I've been trying to make Alexander's for years. Can I try one on you? How old are you, Myra? Seventeen. And I won't breathe a word of it. Is your mother home? Let's chip in and send her to the movies. Get her. Are you kidding? Get her. You're a fool. You could have had an Alexander. Did someone come in, Myra? Do you want me to lie to her, Mr. Clover? I most always It's the police, do. Mrs. Conlon. I want to talk to you. Hello. I was about to go to bed. I... Maybe you won't make it, Catherine. Will she, Mr. Clover? Myra, I'm sure there's nothing here to concern you. Will you please go? No. Myra... You heard I... me. No. When you were in my office, Mrs. Conlon, there was a question we never got finished with. It concerned your husband and the woman with whom he was found dead a year ago. And a man named Joe Gruber. I... I don't at all understand what you're talking about. Mother. Mama. Mom. Don't you have a date tonight, Myra? Every night. It'll keep. They always keep. All of them. All the time. You still haven't told me what I want to know, Mrs. Connell. Well, my husband shot himself. Because of me. Because of my child. He was ashamed of what was going on with that woman. He killed her and then shot himself. 
That's Daddy. That's my pa. Shut up, Myra. Shut up. I've never laid a hand on you, but I... Mother, Mother dear, you're talking like a mom. Never talked to me like this before. The woman found with your husband was his first wife. Did you know that, Mrs. Connell? My husband's first wife? That's not true. When did you find out he wasn't divorced? Why, it's not true. When Mildred Gruber showed up? Daddy had such bad taste in women. Myra! Myra, I'll... You'll hit me? Go ahead. You... I'll... Myra, Myra, please. You found them together, your husband and Mildred. Killed them. Made it look like murder and suicide. Why? Listen to me. Then Joe Gruber showed up. A long lost brother looking for his sister. Looking for Mildred. Found the name Mrs. Hugh Conlon in the phone book. Thought his sister was you. Please, please listen to me. When you met Joe at the bar and he saw that you weren't Mildred, he began to figure and it started to build into money. That's what he wanted when he tried to break into your house. Myra, child, try to understand what I wanted for you. Gruber got away from us. Hold up in a room. Called you for money. You came to his room. Stabbed him to death. You did all that, Catherine? For me? Just because Daddy was a bigamist? Just because all these years you haven't really been married to him? For you. For you, darling. For your name, darling. Wait. When you're married and have children of your own. Wait. Wait. Mother... All for you, darling. Don't you see? I I couldn't let that woman destroy what I built for you, or that man, or your father. The years, the good name I wanted for you, I... Wait till Charles hears this. Myra! (laughs) Charles will die laughing. Wait till I tell him I'm just nobody. (laughs) He'll float the evening in champagne. He'll be here any minute. Wait till I tell him. I'll marry him, Mom. His last name is Tobin. Then I'll have a name, Mom. Myra Tobin. Midnight's a happy time on Broadway. It's a place strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley. And they're heaped there, the bright-eyed kid the voice that whispers from a doorway, the poet, the dregs. It's crowd, and it's laughter, and a Nickelodeon where you get pie in your face. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime... Chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this same time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. In tonight's cast, Barbara Whiting was heard as Myra and Irene Tedrow as Mrs. Conlon. Featured in the cast were Lou Krugman, Martha Wentworth, Norman Field, and Jerry Hausner. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.